ahead and start the recording now. Uh, so happy Tuesday. Welcome to your Monday workshop. That's how many the Tuesdays go. <laughs> um, today we're going to be, uh, since we're starting to dive into our scientific literature, and although actually most of the articles you're looking at this week are, are pretty large articles, we will eventually be starting to go into the individual specific science articles that related to your science projects. And so I wanted to kind of start the summer early with a workshop on how to effectively read this, these articles. Now, some of you may have already had some experience uh, reading scientific articles. If you've done your reading up for this week, for example, you've already started to do that. Um, and many of you probably have experienced the, you know, the joy that is the terse, jargon-rich science article. Um, so I'm very happy to have uh, with us today uh, Genevieve Bjorn, uh, who has developed a new methodology to uh, essentially uh, very efficiently and very effectively read through uh, these uh, scientific articles with a very structured reading approach. We've actually started to use this in our Coolstar lab, so some of you UCSC students have probably seen this in our group meetings. Um, but I don't think we've actually had a formal training on this, so uh, this is an opportunity for everyone to, uh, to practice and, and start to get involved in this. And, and I'll just say personally, this has been transformative for my own research. I've actually always hated reading science papers. I, I actually also hate writing science papers. But I've gotten better on that. Um, but it's just hard to kind of like commit so much time and figure out how you're going to read it and take notes. And we've been able to read whole articles in like 10, 15 minutes. It's, a, it's, it's magic. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Genevieve Bjorn. And uh, Genevieve, you can go ahead and share your slides if you'd like. Okay, hello everybody. It is so nice to be with you and to see all of your cute photos. <laughs> and thank you, um, Adam, for that introduction. Uh, and I would say Siri is not magic, it's magical. Just the scientist in me is nerdy like that, ha ha. Okay, so um, bear with me for a moment while I share my slides. And I'm hoping that what I have on my screen is actually, what you want to see, which is about Siri. Do you see the Siri presentation? Yep. Okay, fantastic. So, um, and I just want to say to anybody who is um, participating in this workshop, you're welcome to screenshot any of the slides that I have. Um, I have submitted this method for publication. It's, it's in review. So uh, I'm not able to share the manuscript yet, but that's hopefully coming soon. Um, but feel free to screenshot if there's something that you find particularly um, interesting. So without further ado, let's start with Siri and it's a method to read scientific papers. So hello, welcome. And uh, what you should know about me is that I teach scientific writing. So I'm trained initially as a biomedical scientist and uh, I've been a writer and a journalist for many years. So these two things mash up in my mind. And then I joined a doctoral program at Johns Hopkins University. And I found myself in a situation that you might relate to with an extremely heavy reading load for primary literature. And it is out of this extremely heavy reading load that this method uh, arose. Now I've got some information on this slide about how you can contact me. Feel free to reach out in any way you like. Um, I'm always happy to carry on the conversation after the workshop. So I wanna start with a quote from uh, one of the students. She's a doctoral student um, in psychology at USC. I interviewed her last fall about reading and what she said was this, reading scientific papers was painful. Sometimes reading one would take all day I always worried about not understanding. And maybe just nod to yourself if you can relate to any or all of this quote, and I'm nodding because I certainly do. And that kind of pain is something that gets really, really serious when you're in a graduate program and you're reading, you know, five, 10, 20 articles a week. There just aren't that many days available. So what do we do? So in this session, we're gonna learn and practice a new method for easier reading and writing of scientific papers that I call Siri. That's our main learning goal. And there are a couple of, of specific benefits that I have found and you might find others and I would love to hear about them if you do, um, either through Adam or directly message me. Um, in terms of reading, um, this is an easier approach to reading. This is not a start to finish read every word method. This is like a hunt and seek method, so it's easier. 
What I also hear from people who learn this method is that it's a more efficient way to read. They can quickly find flaws and analyze papers, which is really important when we're talking about the scientific process. And then another major advantage is that people tell me that it reduces their anxiety and worry about not understanding the main points. Therefore, it also reduces that sense of embarrassment if you're in a group meeting and you're not really sure if it's a flaw or not and you don't say anything. Um, this can help you have some confidence in what you're saying. Now, as far as writing goes, uh, the tool is useful too. We're not gonna talk so much about writing today, but just keep it in mind that um, Siri is useful for being able to map out the sections of a paper, as well as um, combine those sections with what part of the research is intuitive and how those line up can save time in your writing. Um, and then very importantly, it shows what's missing in your own research. So as you continue in your studies, you can think about Siri not just for other people's research, but for actually analyzing your own projects too, to find out what you're missing. So that's a brief summary of why this method is beneficial. So let's talk about what it is. Uh, so I'll start with a bad joke and it goes something like this. Hey Siri, and if you have a phone, an iPhone, you might've said this. Um, hey Siri, tell me a joke. And guess what? Siri will tell you a joke. And Siri says, the past, present, and future walk into a bar. Well, but not during COVID time, obviously, but you know, before or after, All right? Past, present, future walk into a bar. And it was tense. And that cracks me up. <laughs> I laugh at my own jokes. That's how nerdy I actually am. <laughs> Sorry. So we're not talking about that Siri. Just to be clear, we're talking about this Siri. And this Siri is um, standing for claim, evidence, reasoning, and implications. These are the major parts of a scientific argument. And every scientific paper contains, hopefully, all the parts of an argument. And if they don't have these parts, then there's a flaw. Okay, let's talk about what each of these parts means. Let's start with claim. So claim is a plain language declarative answer to a scientific question that defines the specific relationship between variables. And in fields like astronomy, it can also include discoveries and new methods. Okay, so it's pretty much what you've discovered. The evidence is all the fun stuff the data, the test results, the measurements, the observations. They can be quantitative or qualitative or both. This is what we spend the bulk of our time as researchers gathering. Now, the reasoning, which is the third part of Siri, is all of the research and theory that is outside of our study or outside of the study in the paper. So this could be prior research or other scientific theories. And this reasoning is what creates um, links between the evidence that we or the authors have generated and the claim. And this provides the logical basis and infer for inferences and the argument in the paper. The reasoning is super important. It's really challenging in some cases to find out. And in a lot of cases, authors just don't provide good reasoning. You're gonna find that as you start using Siri that reasoning is one of the weakest parts of many papers. But um, we are, we are going to know um, some shortcuts to find that out. And then finally, we're going to talk about implications. So implications are really what is the next uh, two thing, two questions that we can answer. And there are at least uh, two, of, two of these questions that are important to consider. There's more, but one is how is the result in this paper significant beyond the immediate findings? So. For instance, what would be a next study? Um, and where do we go from here, right? What does this mean for the field? What does this mean for the research? So um, the implications are something that usually um, uh, are obvious because the word is imply, imply is often stated. So that's nice for us as readers, okay? So we have the four sections, claim, evidence, reasoning, implications. There's a fifth section that we're gonna talk about very briefly. It's the context. And context is something that uh, is not on this slide, but it's all that background information that every piece of uh, literature has. Okay. Now, if we think more closely about the claim, let's start with that. 
Again, plain language declarative answer to a scientific or research question usually defines the relationship between variables or a discovery or a new method. Key points here are that the claim is something that um, is going to be a part of the main hypothesis of the paper. And again, it could be discovery, a new method technique, it could build on previous work, it could be a rebuttal to a previous claim. And papers usually contain more than one claim. Often there are additional or secondary claims and they're buried in the paper. And then there are some key phrases that we can use to hone in on claims. Things like we found, there is, and when there is is followed by some kind of discovery or comparison statement observation of, discovery of, some of the key phrases that are really frequently used with claims. Now with, um, with, oh, my slide jumped. With evidence, again, this is all the fun stuff, the data, the results, measurements, observations. And this is what the authors have measured, they've computed, they've modeled, they've compiled. Those are some of the verbs that go with evidence. And the evidence is what forms the basis for the claim, right? The claim grows out of the evidence. So the authors here will define uh, samples, populations, and other, um, other groups under study. Uh, there's always a methods that precedes the evidence. They use some particular kind of method to generate their evidence. Um, again, it can be quantitative, meaning involving numbers and statistics, or it can be qualitative, that's descriptive and narrative, it can be both. In my field, we use mixed methods, so we use both. Uh, often you'll see evidence in tables, charts, graphs, but it can also be paragraphs, just straight up text. And some of the active verbs that we find with evidence very often are things like modeled, calculated, observed. Those verbs that suggest the active uh, collection of data. <clears throat> Now with reasoning, again, I mentioned this is one of the most challenging parts of theory, mainly because this involves both theory and prior research. So these are factors that are outside of the study that are influencing how the researchers think about their evidence. So um, it could be any type of existing law or theory or property, um, prior papers, prior models, and all of these are gonna be a logical basis for inference and argument. So again, it's gonna be a logical progression of analysis that connects evidence to claim. This, the reasoning is always gonna to connect to external knowledge um, beyond the research study, okay? That's a really key part about reasoning. It's gonna to connect to external knowledge beyond the study. And again, could be a previously published analysis method, theory, or some other paper that supports the um, connection between the evidence and the claim. There's lots of different kinds of reasoning. So this is also where reasoning can be a little more complicated. And here at the level one version of Siri, we're just going to introduce you to some of these ideas. And then later, as you get more advanced with Siri, we can talk more about what some of these different types of reasoning look like. Um, but if any of you have ever taken a philosophy class or a rhetoric class or even a logic class, um, you'll know that there's inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, and then there's kind of a compare contrast to rule out other interpretations. So those are the three main types of reasoning that we use in science. And then some of the key phrases that we identify as being associated with reasoning are things like this explains, or this matches the predictions, or this confirms a previous result. This indicates um, where there's a reference from the current study to some external knowledge, either theory or publication. Okay, so our last point here in Siri um, are the implications. And again, this is gonna be at least two questions that get answered. How is the result significant beyond the immediate findings? And where do we go from here? The implications the key points are that um, they explain the impact of the result on the area of research or on the field more broadly. And 
The implications also state what needs to be done next to test or build further upon the claim. Some of the key phrases are really obvious. This is actually the most obvious one. So I actually find this implications often to be the easiest thing to find in a paper because the phrases are things like this implies. One implication is. Implications include. Also suggests, could also suggest, things like that. Okay, and they're often at the end. So that's even easier. Now, I, um, I would not be complete if I didn't mention context. So context is the whole scientific background situation that led the authors to conduct the study in the first place. The context is what is usually the first part of every paper. It's that first section, background information. Sometimes it's called context. Um, it's usually everything that um, it leads the authors to think this research needs to be done. And it includes the topical or field background, um, something about the underlying problem, some kind of gap in the research, something like that. And this is a really good place where uh, jargon starts to come in and it's necessary to start defining words. So it's very easy to get overwhelmed in the context part because lots of new jargon comes in and it's not all necessary, but it sounds good. Um, and some of the key phrases to know that you're in the context area of the paper are things like experiments began with, a decade before, uh, these advances have enabled, and then I also mentioned there's a gap in the scholarship. That's a common one. Okay, and, and then anything referencing history before the study is probably context. Okay, so let's just summarize. We've talked about um, claims, evidence, reasoning, implications, a little bit about context. And we've talked about what those individual components mean and some key phrases to help identify them. So this slide shows us where these uh, components of an argument live in a publication. So this might be a good slide to screenshot just so you can refer to it in your practice in just a few minutes. So uh, the claim, if the paper is very well written, a claim is going to be the title just straight up. A really good paper has a claim. That's all the title is, is the claim. And uh, if it's not in the title, then it's often in the abstract. Um, or it could be in the results and figure section, or it could be in the discussion. And if there is more than one claim, some subclaims, sometimes papers will have two, three, four claims, those subclaims are often buried in the results in the discussion sections. Right? You might only find the main claim in the title, for instance. Now, evidence uh, usually doesn't appear in the title, but in a well-written abstract, there'll be some evidence there. And the evidence is primarily going to be in the results and figures and discussion section. Um, now, the discussion doesn't always have evidence, but a good discussion will link the claim to the evidence through the reasoning. So there may be some reference to the key pieces of evidence there. Um, and then also in the methods section, um, as I mentioned before, methods is what the study design is and what tools the authors used. And this helps us to understand how they get their evidence. So it builds up to the evidence. And then finally, the implications. Like I said, this is probably the easiest one to find, I think. Um, and that's always in the discussion. Or some papers have a specific section titled implications. And then you could just go right there. OK, so that is a summary of what the essential elements of a scientific argument include and where to find them in a standard publication. OK. So let's do a worked example. I think this begins to make a little more sense when we can see how we actually apply these ideas to a paper. So this particular example is coming from Nature Astronomy. This was actually in the first issue ever published in that journal back in 2016. And um, it is about a, 
a hot giant planet hat P7b. Okay, so here's the abstract and the title. So I want to look at this and see if I can find the Siri elements here without even having to look for the rest of the paper. So let's see how they do. Well, right, the first thing I can see, variability in the atmosphere of a hot giant planet, that's a claim, right? Variability in the atmosphere, that's what they're finding of this planet. So they've made their claim, the title, good job authors, very good. And with nature publications, this is often the case, right? With a really high quality publication, you'll get a, you'll get a really clear claim in the title. So then the next section is evidence, right? Claim first, evidence. So now I'm just gonna scan through this abstract and what I'm looking for are numbers. I'm just gonna see where we go. And if I get to line, uh, I see hat P7B there on line four, line five, I start to see minus 0. 0.0086 plus 0. 0.0033, da, 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 da. Yeah, that's numbers. And what I'm seeing is that that sentence that those numbers are in, says here we present variations in the peak offset ranging between these numbers. That's evidence, right? Straight up. So good job authors, you put evidence in your abstract. Now, if I scan down a little bit further, I've highlighted a second sentence here. The variability occurs on a time scale of tens to hundreds of days. These are numbers written as words. So more evidence, right? Because they're, they're also providing us with a time for the other peak offset number. Now, I don't have to know anything about a, a peak offset to understand that that's evidence, right? And that's really one of the powers of this method is that you don't have to deeply understand the result in order to be able to identify that it is a result, okay? So let's go to the next part, reasoning. And I said, this could be one of the hardest parts and I wanna just keep scanning for anything that sounds like they're gonna be explaining how their evidence connects to their claim. So in the sentence following, the variability occurs on a time scale of tens to hundreds of days, that next sentence reads, these shifts in brightness are indicative of, indicative of, that was one of the reasoning phrases, they're starting to, maybe explain something. And it sounds to me like they're offering some explanation about this changing balance of thermal emission. So if we keep going, um, they're starting to use the words explaining of the observed variation. This whole last bit is explanation. So good job authors, they've put some reasoning in their abstract. Now, the last part of the official series is implications. And already, just by scanning through this abstract, I found the word implying. I don't know, have you seen it yet? Can you find it? Because it's right there in the middle. And I'm going to underline that in blue, implying that the peak brightness repeatedly shifts. That's an implication. I don't even need to know what peak brightness is, right? It's just, it's an implication. And I can unpack what that means later in my research group and with my advisor and, and I can take my time to understand it, but there it is. So what's the rest of this abstract? There's a whole bunch of text I didn't mark. And it has, if we start to read it as an exoplanet orbits its host star, reflects in its light, uh, this is starting to tell it, sound like they're telling us a story. By observing this light, we can study the atmosphere. Uh, there's a wide range of phenomenon ground doors exhibit variability, blah, blah, blah. This is a story. Oh, background information. So context, right? That's all context. And again, that's something that I can unpack later with a group or advisor if there's some parts of that that I don't understand. But I don't need to panic right now or get stuck if I don't understand everything right now, right? The point is to be able to dissect the argument so that I can understand what the parts are and I can understand if the authors have done all the parts and then later uh, begin to figure out uh, and get help with what I don't understand. Okay, so that is our first worked example. 
Uh, and just like that, we identified the main points of a paper, even if we've never worked with giant planets before. And, uh, and what we're aiming for here is about 10 to 15 minutes of hunting per paper, right? So not a lot of time, not like the whole day that the student at the beginning whose quote we shared was using, right? We wanna keep us efficient. So we're gonna build up to try to do this in about 10 or 15 minutes per paper. Okay, so just a reminder of where the Siri reading categories tend to be located. Feel free to screenshot them this if you didn't get the last one. Um, you could use it for your practice. This one's color coded, so it sort of shows you <laughs> where, the, where the sections uh, relate. Okay, and then I think ne the next part of our, um, of our time together is um, we're gonna work on some examples. Um, I think Adam's gonna do an example, another worked example more in depth, and then we're gonna have some time to work in small groups. And um, the last thing I'll say uh, before we go to uh, another worked example with Adam is that it's important to take notes while you're using Siri. You wanna be able to identify the main points in each paper because what we're gonna build up to in level two of the Siri workshop, which is our second hour, is a compare contrast, right? We wanna be able to use our understanding of the core parts of an argument to compare the findings of one paper to the findings of another, right? That's really what we're going for here is to be able to compare contrast. And this is fundamental for your research and for your writing. And we also wanna reduce the number of times you have to go back to the paper. Ideally, it's one and done. You take your notes one time and you're done. You don't have to touch it again, hopefully. Um, any form of notes you like will work. Um, there's a template that um, Adam's gonna share around. Uh, you can use that too. Okay, so that's what the template looks like. And I will just leave that slide there uh, if you wanna reach out to me. And then I'll turn it back to Adam to do our, our next example. Thanks, Genevieve. Does anybody have any questions for Genevieve before we move on to another worked example? Okay, well, I'm sure some okay. will emerge. Oh, Bridget, yes, go ahead. Okay, so if one, if one of the CERI are not found, does that mean that it's not found in the paper itself? And then do we just kind of like, we don't have to look for that specific thing? Like, let's say we can't find an implications. Do we just not look for implications in the paper? So that's a good question. Um, and thanks for asking it. So one of the really wonderful parts about Siri is if you're looking for implications and you're looking in the section where they normally live, like the discussions or the results, and they're just not there, um, you have identified a critique of this paper, right? And as a novice reader, that is really cool to be able to do, to say like, okay, these guys did this and this and this, but they didn't talk about the next steps. So you can already offer something very valuable to your colleagues because you can find what's missing. Now, I will also say that it's probably 80% of the time that those key phrases show up, um, implications or implying, things like that. But if you don't see those words, they could still be there in a slightly different phrase. Um, so I would just encourage you, if you don't see any version of those key phrase, just to do a quick double check and make sure that they just didn't write it some other way. Um, but typically it's missing if, it's, if those key phrases are not there. Yeah. And this is something that you can also check with your group mates too. Like if you're like, I'm in the application section and I don't see any, does anybody else find any, right? That's a great question to share out. And then you, you know, others may have found the same thing, like, oh yeah, these guys just didn't do it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead and, and jump in. So I'm gonna uh, put in my slides, but I'm also gonna put something in the chat window here. Uh, this is going to be a link to our worked example. Um, and that example is going to be another recent paper. Um, this is by a researcher named Zhao, Weishun Zhao. 
um, and we'll see what the paper is in just a bit. Um, I've provided a link here, and this link points to what's known as the NASA ADS or NASA Abstract uh, Data Service. I think that's what it stands for. Um, but this is one of our go-to websites for accessing the literature. In fact, we're going to see this website again. Uh, I think later on in the summer, Roman's going to do a literature search uh, session where how do we find papers that are related to the papers we're looking at. Um, Mass ADS turns out to be a really good source for that. So let me go ahead and click on this link and you can click on the link on your own computer as well. Um, this is the web page that comes up and uh, this is the abstract right here. And it's all kinds of information that we'll uh, possibly spend some time going through at some point here, but um, you'll get familiar with this interface quite a bit because this is how we access our pages. Um, but more importantly, I wanna point out that the links to the papers are over here on the right side. Uh, there's a couple different versions here. Uh, the, this symbol is a PDF symbol. So this gives you access to the PDF from the publisher. This gives you access to the PDF from archive. Archive is a, a sort of public um, uh, database for sharing uh, uh, published papers, usually before they actually end up in the journals. This is one way that we, are, we disseminate our research ahead of the journal publication. Uh, and you notice a little green symbol here. This tells you whether it is open access or not. Um, and so often you may find, particularly for recent papers, that the publisher uh, link will not have a green symbol, which means you either have to have a subscription to that journal, or more often than not, your you know the your your university has a subscription you can access it that way. Um, but the archive is also often a usual uh, a good way to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that link, um, which brings up the new window, and brings up the PDF of the uh, publication. Now. Uh, Genevieve showed an example with just the abstract for a paper. Uh, this is now the whole thing, although uh, and it looks like it ends at three, but actually there's a whole bunch of extra pages here. Um, this is actually a 12 page document. Um, and if we scroll through, that includes a lot of text, includes some figures, some tables. Uh, sorry, it's a little slow reading in right now. Uh, I'm running a lot of things. Um, and uh, some of these figures actually have a lot of data behind them. So that's partly why it's running a little bit slow. Um, in any case, you know, if you wanted to read through this straight through, it would take some time. Um, and you know, there's a lot of symbols in here you'd have to sort of interpret. We're gonna do an example where we kind of break this down a little bit more quickly. So uh, if you wanna follow along, um, I'm using this uh, Google Doc page. That's the uh, worked example. And I see several of you already found it where I'm gonna put in these claim evidence reasoning implications uh, pieces. So I'm gonna start here with the claim. And um, as uh, Genevieve mentioned, often a good place to look is, is the claim in the title itself? So let's go back and look at the title. Uh, if we can get back up there, eventually. Sorry, computer's a little slow. Okay, let's see. Well, let's do this while that's loading. Let's go back to this page and see. So uh, the title says a gap in the lower main sequence revealed by Gaia data release two. Uh, what do you folks think? Do you think that's a, that's a claim? Any opinions? Yes. How come, Bridget? Um, it sounds like a like a statement, like exactly. they're certain it's there. Yes, yeah. So, you know, as uh, Genevieve mentioned, it's you know it's a clear declarative statement. So that's the cat. That's the case. If there is a gap, right, in the lower main sequence, um, it's a clear declarative statement between um, quantitative variables. Now we have talked about the main sequence on the color magnitude diagram. So that's kind of implicit in this statement when we talk about the lower main sequence. We're talking about a a sequence on a color magnitude diagram and color and magnitude are two quantitative uh, variables. So uh, yeah, we can immediately say that the claim is that there is, sorry, that there is a gap um, on the main sequence. Okay. Um, now that's uh, a very broad statement, we can look at a bit more detail if we look particularly through the abstract and we see um, 
that they, they clarify that the gap is at this particular absolute magnitude, mg approximately 10. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a little bit more information here about um, that they find this gap. Let me bring this up here. Uh, the gap presents a diagonal feature that dips toward lower luminosities at redder colors. So this is giving us a little bit more detail. Um, the gap is very narrow, all right, um, and is near the luminosity temperature regime where M dwarf stars transition from partially to fully convective. We talked a little bit about convection um, on the other at the other day. So um, I would put in probably some more of these details. So there's a gap in the main sequence at M g approximately 10. And um, the other thing is that the gap is narrow. And we can quantify it because we quantify it there in the abstract, about 0 0.05 magnitudes. And uh, the gap occurs at the transition from partial to full convection in m dwarfs. All right. So obviously there's, this is, a, I would say the main claim, but these other subclaims help kind of uh, clarify that a little bit. So all I got that was just from the title and the abstract, and that's usually a good, a good starting point. Now we wanna look at what the evidence for that claim is. And as noted, this is gonna typically be in the methodology section. So I'm gonna skip right past the introduction. And um, uh, even though there's nothing that says clearly methodologies, usually the second section in the paper provides those methodologies. So even though they title it the gap here, um, we, can, we can use that. So usually evidence is the data that's involved. And so an important thing is they say that the data was retrieved from the Gaia archive, all right? So that provides us with uh, uh, what, where the evidence come from. This is uh, uh, data from Gaia. Now, what kind of data is that? Well. Uh, let's see if we can see, dig down here. Um, first of all, I know that Gaia has astrometry data. Um, and um, trying to see if they have any specific thing where they say. Well, so they at least describe, they list their variables here. They have absolute G magnitude and they have this color. Remember that the differences in magnitudes are a color. So we can, include that in uh, what data is provided. So absolute G and uh, GR minus GB. Now it's often also useful to kind of get an idea of what kind of data they extracted. So there's another important phrase here, it's stars within 100 parsecs in this DR2, which is the second data release. But I think that's also important to point out that these are um, for stars within 100 parsecs. So that kind of sets our sample. All right, so that's the data they used. Um, they, uh, let's see, I can find a little bit more information in here. Uh, probably then the most important thing is if we go down a little bit, we can actually see the data. And so, you know, the evidence also emerges by comparing these two quantities and, you know, visualizing them. And then you can actually quite clearly see the gap in there. So um, now here's a question. So this is the two quantities plotted together. If I say, well, look, I can see the gap quite clearly in there. Is that evidence or is that reasoning? Uh, I think this evidence. Okay, Adriana says evidence. Any other thoughts? I think maybe it is reasoning because it's not just like raw data, it's like more, it's like an interpreta interpretation. Okay. Any other thoughts? I think it's a evidence since it's like a model in some sort. Ah, okay, so, so the interesting question, interesting you said there. So you said it's a model. Now, remember, when we talk about models in science, we're talking about, um, you know, quantitative sort of quantitative representations of a theory. So we say, I have some theory about how stars work. I'm going to 
use a computer program or some kind of way to make a, you know, make a prediction, basically, what the data is going to look like based on that theory. Now, is there any theory in this image? This is actually a good question. Thanks for raising it, Jovan. Sorry, I'm not looking at the chat window. Uh, you might be answering this in the chat window. All right, so is there any theory involved in making this, this plot? Well, uh, on the paper it says that the, there is a um, some region of a stellar population, so it can be the um, it's uh, data from the sky. I mean, um, to even I don't know much, but it seems that it's a uh, uh, there is data. There there is no modeling to me. Yeah, and I, I would agree with you, Adriana, that you know this this is one of the things that astronomers just do all the time. They've got two pieces of information that are you know related to each other, you know, in a catalog, and we just plot them against each other. There's no theory involved in that. And in fact, that's one of the amazing things about the main sequence, which is what we're seeing here, this distribution of points, that just comes from plotting two measured quantities. So there's no model here. Um, and so that so and so I, I focus a little bit on this, Jermon, because models are part of the evidence that we bring to bear. But in this case, you don't need a model to see, hey, there's a line here. Now, let me go back to the original question is, you know, is this line that I can see in this plot, is that evidence or reasoning? And, you know, we got kind of mixed uh, responses from everyone. And honestly, that's, that's a good point because this is kind of one of these borderline cases. And you'll see this happen uh, on many of these, uh, these examples. Um, when I look at this, I just see a gap. And that to me, that's evidence because I can just see it right in the data, right? I'm not having to make an interpretation. I'm not having to uh, do any logical argument. I see a gap. <laughs> um, now, in some cases, though, when people see a feature in their data, they might have had to do some manipulation of the data to make that feature emerge. And we're going to see example of that a little bit later on. Um, so my personal opinion is that this is evidence. Genevieve, I'm wondering what you think, since you had have had a little bit more experience in, in detailing these, what you thought about this. Yeah, I think this is actually um, a good illustration of where it can be difficult to decide if something is evidence or reasoning, because as you mentioned, you can just see a straight gap without any connection to prior research or any modeling, uh, any computational things on top of it. But, and I think it was, uh, there were a couple of folks who mentioned reasoning as a possibility. This is still a plot, right? And a plot is a form of analysis that comes out. And so some analysis has to be done in order to see this gap. And so I think it's understandable to then go, well, there's, there might be some reasoning here because we've done an analysis. This is not just straight numerical data out of the code, right? It had to, we had to plot it or they had to plot it. But again, it comes back to the, the question for reasoning. I think the standard that I use is, does this connect to prior research or theory? Do we, do we in some way need prior research or theory to understand or interpret this result? And in this case, we do not. We can just make a simple plot, which is a form of analysis that does nudge us toward reasoning. But we're still, I believe, on the side of evidence because we don't have to connect to any external knowledge. Okay, so a lot, a lot of detail on gaps, aren't there? All right, so I'm going to put, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put down. Uh, we have this data. We uh, we see a gap uh, uh, in the plot of mg versus. I think I have the num the colors reversed here, so let me make sure I correct that. All right. Um, and if we scroll down a little bit further, um, I think it's going to take a little while because there's a lot of data points here. Um, sorry, this unfortunately 
when folks have large data sets, they sometimes make very dense figures. There we go. Um, so as I'm scrolling here, they have more of these kind of plots. Again, maybe M being to uh, compare uh, the gap in different places. And that's actually important because um, even, I'm not, even though I'm not reading the text, I can see that they're bringing in new magnitudes in here. Here's a J and a KS. There's the KS there. I think if you scroll up, there might be another magnitude list up there. There's MKS. So um, the other thing that if you read through, you find is that they also bring in um, two mass J, K, S magnitudes as well. So they're bringing in additional photometric evidence to this. Um, and then what I often will do is I just keep scanning through what would normally be that methodology section, which ends at this point where it says discussion. Um, and I don't see any other evidence being brought to bear, although I'm having a little trouble scrolling through it. Um, so I only see those kind of magnitudes that are present in there. So that's really all the evidence that they have is just this observational measurements uh, from the Gaia uh, spacecraft for this 100 parsec sample, which includes absolute magnitudes and colors, and then a couple more magnitudes from this two mass survey. That's really all the evidence that they have here. But you know, I think the other piece of the evidence is that when they plot these together, they see this line. All right, so that's that. And then the next thing is the reasoning. And again, we look for this in the analysis section of the paper. Um, again, in this case, we don't have a very clear analysis section, but we do have, um, let's go back to that page. Um, we have, you know, I would say this gap is the evidence because we see the gap. And then um, the next section, is probably the closest thing we have to analysis because you can see it's gap in different colors and more distant samples. So it, we can already kind of get an idea that what we're gonna do is they're gonna analyze this gap uh, and see if it shows up in other places. This is going to be a form of reasoning because one of the questions one can ask is, well, I saw this in one this one plot, is it real, right? And that immediately comes to a reasoning. How do we argue? that this is a real detection while well, we bring in this other evidence, right? So what are some of the lines of evidence they do? Well, we can just actually scroll down to the pictures. Um, again, very slow, <laughs> slowly scroll down. Um, one of the reasons they show these other plots here is, uh, and you can find this in the text, and I apologize, I'm just, it's so slow that I'm not gonna be able to dive in there as quickly as I'd like to. Um, but what they do is they see the gap, in these other magnitudes. So they showed the picture with absolute G and the B minus R colors. And then they go and they look at other magnitudes that include K and J minus K. And they kind of see the gap in there. It's a little hard to tell, but you, if you stare at it closely enough, you can kind of see that there's a little bit gap in there. So one of their arguments is that they, um, they also see the gap in infrared magnitudes. Uh, J and K. And then further along, there's another plot which shows the same kind of sequence here, but now they're doing it in different distance bands. So this is zero to 100 uh, parsecs. And it's not totally obvious by my eye where the gap is in here, but they compare it in these different bands in different uh, populations. And uh, they talk about this. Um, in this section here, can the gap be produced for other stars and other parts of the galaxies? Uh, oops, let me see if I got that right. No, I'm sorry. I think this was discussed a little bit further up, which of course the text is a little bit slow right now. But they basically argue that they can see it in this uh, population. Um, they can't see it as well in this population because uh, as they talk about up here, it becomes a little bit, the, the data values become a little bit more uncertain and they don't see it quite as well in the even farther distance here because you just have fewer data points. And so uh, one of the arguments that they make, and I think this is a little bit scrolled down here, why is this gap not seen before? That's because now, we'll just read this whole sentence. The available number of parallax of REM dwarfs for a limited number had larger errors. Because the gap is narrow and subtle, these attributes for the available parallax preclude identifying the gap until a much larger high precision parallaxes were obtained with Gaia. So one of their arguments then, reasonings, is that um, 
this is seen for the first time because the data is better than before. We have more accurate data, right? Now, this kind of line of discussion questions here, even though usually you look for the reasoning in the analysis part, actually provides some good aspects of reasoning because, again, if the big question is, is this a real gap and does it mean anything? Um, you can see they kind of go through reasons why uh, this gap isn't due to some other stuff. They're essentially looking at counter arguments and ruling out those counter, counter arguments to support their claim. And again, reasoning is what is connecting the evidence to the claim. They support their claim by looking at things that could explain away this result and arguing that they don't follow through. So is the gap due to bias? Um, well, they say that um, their main conclusion here is there's no biases uh, based on how they just, the Gaia ca catalog is described that could explain away this, um, this gap. Like there isn't something where the measurements suddenly change at absolute magnitude of 10. Um, is this due to the presence of multiple main sequences? So could there be different stellar populations that give rise to that? They point out in this that there are other, there are globular clusters that have multiple main sequences. Um, but uh, the, let me see, if we can parse this last statement here. The gap we outline here for nearby stars has a very different slope, so it's not consistent with gaps resulting from multiple main sequence populations. So they say that multiple main sequences exist in these other special systems, but when they look at this data set, there's no evidence that that's there. So I'm going to add those two pieces. Um, so they, it's not due to biases in the data. It's not due to multiple main sequences. Um, we talked about why it's not seen before. They look at some of these other different possibilities, and honestly, this is starting to get into more detail that we don't necessarily need to know. Um, and then um, they get to this last part when they talk about is the gap related to the onset of full convection. Now, remember, one of their claims is that this is happening at the point where stars go from not partially convective to fully convective. So we can scan through this a little bit, and you know they say that uh, this. Uh, change happens at a point about spectral type M3. Um, and they point out in this next figure that the uh, gap, which is about here, corresponds to the mostly yellow stars, which are stars of type M3. So they, they point the gap out there. And if we keep scrolling a little bit further down, come on down, come on, you can do it. All right. They actually do bring in some models here to look at what are the ages of the population and metallicities. So in fact, we do have another set of evidence here that we have to include. They introduce a new set of models if we scroll up, we can see these are called the Parsec models. Actually, there's two of them, YAPSI and Parsec. So we need to include that in our evidence. YAPSI Parsec models. I'm going to keep scrolling down here. Come on. All right, guys, the figures are really slow on this computer. <clears throat> and I think, unfortunately, the sentence I wanted to look at was just on the bottom of this page. OK, so on this paragraph, um, they start to talk about the connection between magnetic activity, you can see magnetic topology, that's a, a fancy word. Um, the gap shows a sudden transition from, this is the topology says they so should see a sudden transition from one state to another, which happens to fall near the mass where stars are modeled to become fully convective. And so as we read through here, we see that, you know, they, their evidence, you know, their evidence is the gap, they use the models to connect where that gap is to a particular mass, 
And then they say that this mass is based on these other models where, or prior research, that this is kind of where people think the convection sets in. So again, in terms of the uh, reasoning, I would say a reasoning would be um, the mass at which the gap is placed is at the same mass that prior research indicates stars go from partial oops, to full convection. So again, that was one of the claims and the evidence is the gap and we're connecting that gap to this claim by pointing out that the mass that that gap corresponds to is the same mass at which this convection uh, happens, right? So that's mapping the evidence to the claim. All right, now, if we go down to implications here, so uh, we do have a final section here, which says a future study of the gap, which is a great indicator that there's gonna be some implications in here, All right? And so, um, so they kind of summarize their claim, right? Based on the evidence here, the observed drop cell numbers is probably related to several change in structure. We suggest the following studies be undertaken to further understand this new feature. So they very clearly lay out, here's what the next steps need to be, right? So they say, examine the stars falling in the gap, measure accurate di uh, dynamical masses, radian metal acidities in the gap, and determine the rotation periods, and evaluate the photometric variability. So all of those are really great implications. Now, and that, one of the easy things I can do here is I can just copy and paste these because they're almost word for word, nice implications. But I want to point out one thing that's very important when you do this, you put it in quotes. Oops, let's try that. I didn't quite do the character turn. Okay, but that's fine. Um, I'm putting these in quotes because later on, if I'm using this information to uh, you know, perhaps write a report or write a context section for my paper, I don't want to copy this word for word in my next writing because that would be plagiarism. So I am copying this in, but putting in quotes so that as a reminder to myself that if I'm going to you know, report this out, that I will rewrite this so that it is in my own words. And Genevieve also suggests that another thing you can do is to even put this in yellow highlights, which we can do quite easily. So let me get the rest of this in here. Sorry, my computer is super slow right now. All right, so let me make sure I put in quotes on these things. And I'm going to take Genevieve's suggestion um, to put all this in yellow highlights, just so I am absolutely sure that I changed this to my own words somewhere down the line. Right? But you know, in this case, it was very useful that they actually outlined the implication steps for me in this nice numerated form, and I can just copy them in. But just be very careful that you indicate that you copied it in your notes so you don't accidentally copy the text in something else. All right, so I got everything through implications. We could also go into context. And again, that would be just looking at the first section. So we're doing this completely out of order. And that's an important feature of the Siri method that you do not read this paper from front to back. You wanna go and hunt and find the information that you're looking for. Um, and so, you know, as I scan through here, they talk about the HR diagram, about how those are measured. Um, uh, a lot of this is just kind of detailing how the parallaxes of nearby red stars and the fact that most red dwarfs near, within 100 parsecs do not have distance measurements. Uh, that's actually a nice important phrase. So I'm going to copy that into my context. Um, that's again in the past. All right, and again, using quotes to indicate things that I have copied. And then they talk about Gaia coming in and providing new data and a lot more data. Um, and some of the results that have come from Gaia, there are two main sequences, 
uh, for nearby stars called by metallicity difference, and the distribution of nearby white dwarfs shows multiple sequences. Um, and in this work, we present a new feature, right? So I would say that the other context is that uh, Gaia has enabled the detection of new features in the main sequence. Okay. And that's kind of everything. So, you know, how long did that take? Genevieve, re time me? I was going a little bit slow, but how, did, how long did it take me? 30 minutes. Okay. So I went a little slow because I was kind of talking through my process, but you can see that, you know, we're able to get all of the key aspects of this paper condensed down into a one page set of notes um, very effectively by doing this kind of hunting around and pecking for the information. So we do should we should take a break at this point. Let me see. Does folks want to have any questions before we take just a quick five minute break? All right. Not seeing any questions either by hands or chat. Uh, let's take a break and we'll re reconvene at five o eight. And at that point, you're going to do your own Siri test. So back at 508. Be right back. All right, everyone, welcome back. So uh, the next phase of this is you're going to get some practice doing it in groups of three. Um, and so let me just share the slide up here. Um, you're going to be looking at one particular paper that's actually related to this one by McDonald and Giesis, and I'm going to put that into the chat window so you have the links. Um, and then uh, you're going to be reviewing this paper, and then we've set up a collaborative document that you're going to enter in according to your breakout room the elements of Siri. So claim, evidence, reasoning, implications. And if your group gets ahead of time, you'll have some time to maybe put in some of the context. And again, you want to put in somewhere between two, three, or four elements for each of these. Even if you just get one, that's a good, uh, good amount. Um, and you do not want to read the papers all the way through. You want to find these elements within the document. Uh, and again, you can see in the notes here, we indicate you know, where you can, you can find those. So. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start up the breakout rooms. Uh, here we go. And uh, again, as a group of three, find these elements in the paper, fill them in, and then we're going to come back together in about 20 minutes. We'll see you then. Not enough time. <laughs> well, that's part. It's you know, it's part of the high pressure situation. They change our way of reading uh, to do it in a time scale and. And again, I should say in our research group, we typically do 15 minutes for this, but of course they've had some practice. So again, part of the, all of these skill set is to practice this out a little bit. Um, okay, so let, I just wanna go around through the rooms and um, kind of hear from what you've uh, chosen for some of these elements. So let me uh, start with room one. Room one, what did you get for uh, the claims for this paper? Claim or claims? So room one, do you have a representative speaker who is not Dino? Sure, I can go. If, if anyone else from group one could also add on to it, feel free to do so, please. I think we talked about how um, the gap we saw earlier, the narrow gap, it could be explained by a few things in combination of uh, helium mixing and convection zones, and it could be explained by Know, um, current existing stellar evolution models. Okay, all right. That sounds like a pretty clear gap. Was that gap in the? Was that claim in the title? So let me look at where, the title. Where again. did you find? Where did you find it? Uh, the title didn't really um, mention what was exactly the cause. Like, what was exactly the explanation? It did mention though there is an explanation, and I think. Uh, we found that in the abstract where where they talk about like what the explanation actually is. 
OK, so you found it not it wasn't in the title, but it was in the abstract. Right. Yeah. OK. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, room two. Uh, do you want to share the evidence that you found in this paper? Actually, sorry, before we go there, does anybody else want to add to the claims that uh, room one uh, or Jaman uh, pointed out? Uh, at least uh, on our team, I th I, uh, we thought that the claims were pretty clear themselves. Uh, at least we saw that most of them were on uh, on the abstract. So we we agree with uh, room one. OK. And I see in your notes, you know, you guys can kind of go see what the other groups uh, also wrote down. It's a good way to kind of see how your, your peers are looking at this. I noticed that you put in, your group put in like the specific places where they're found. Um, that's a good sort of practice practice as you're practicing. That's a good thing to do. Um, uh, and I, you know, I would say I agree with Jaman. So the, the title does have an explanation for the gap, but it doesn't say what the explanation is. So it's almost a claim, but that's not quite a claim, right? The claim has to be a clear declarative statement and an explanation is not clear or declarative. We were thinking that uh, maybe a part of the title was a claim, not the whole title itself. Maybe a uh, gap in the Gaia HRD for M dwarfs, but I don't know if that was already discovered. So we didn't actually know if, if we had to put only that section of the title as a claim or the whole title itself as a whole claim. Well, so the point is not to find the sentence and copy it into your notes. It is to state clearly what the claim in the paper is. Now, a good paper will have a very clear sentence that says, you know, we find this, or, you know, the results indicate this, something that is a clear claim. But you shouldn't just be piecing, like making pieces together. You should be finding for that one sentence that makes the claim. In some cases, there may be multiple claims in the paper. Okay. Okay. Um, so room two, and I think Carlos, you're in that room. Uh, do some, does someone want to uh, discuss the evidence that they found in the paper? The evidence that we found are based on the histogram. So we just select two of them. And the first one we found uh, is the sentences that say, rendering sampling mass between 0 0.3 and 0 0.38 mass and stereo age between 0 and 8.8 .8 gigahertz. The second evidence that we found is about the transition between these behaviors for main sequences start occur over the narrow mass range from 0 0.135 to 0 0.35. Okay, so, um, so the first one I would say is probably a subset of the evidence. It's providing a very specific parameter range for the analysis they did. Um, so that it can be a piece of the evidence. The second line is not evidence though. Um, and part of that is because it is actually reflecting on something that they've observed based on their calculation. So they've had to do their calculation and now they're analyzing that calculation and they're observing from their calculation that um, there is this transition in their models that occurs over a narrow mass range. And again, if you think about it, that is connecting the evidence, which a very important piece of evidence that's not here is that they're using models. So there needs to be some description of what models are using. The fact that they're using models is an important piece of evidence. Um, but that second sentence is really connecting what the models show to the claim, because the claim is that there's this narrow gap. And that narrowness is coming from the calculation from the models. So that's an important distinction between evidence and reasoning. And Carlos, you're right. That's more of a reasoning statement than necessarily an evidence statement. Um, are there other pieces of evidence that uh, folks in different groups found uh, in their readings? Did you say the evidence? Evidence, yes. Well, we found that the um, pot or the Protecting conductive opacities are used. Okay, so that's another uh, kind of uh, uh, 
clarification on how how they're modeling, right? And that is piece of evidence, right? That is some parameter range, some assumption that they're making in their modeling that is an ingredient to their calculation. So you're absolutely right, that's an evidence. Um, but one thing I still haven't heard is, I think the most important piece of evidence. <laughs> and instead of leaving it as a question, <laughs> it's the models themselves, right? Um, and when you're, you're, you really have to start from the, what are they bringing to bear on this problem? And it's, it's important to really start from the biggest point. They're bringing to bear you know, evolutionary stellar models. They're actually calculating out with these models what these stars do over time so that they then can compare ultimately to the observations. And by the way, the observations are also part of the evidence because that's what they're comparing the models to. If they didn't have the observations, they couldn't actually support their claim. So as I said to a couple of groups, as I went through, the evidence is the ingredients of your, of your, you know, your souffle. And the reasoning is the recipe. And if you forget some salt or you forget the sugar, you're going to have not a souffle. <laughs> so, so you want to think about all the, all the ingredients that have to be there in order to go and, and make this claim to really get to the point where they can make this claim. Um, any other pieces of evidence that folks saw in their um, reading or skimming um, that they, they want to add in? Uh, also, we, we, we put the temperature and pressure from the atmosphere models at optical deep are going to tend to the tree to set the outer boundary conditions. I don't know what we choose yeah. that one. So that is, I would say that again is a, um, it is part of the evidence. It's part of the kind of detailed assumptions that are made in the models. Um, and so, you know, in particular, if you want to be very clear about what assumptions are made, assumptions are ingredients, right? So that's certainly something that would fit into the evidence. Um, you have to be a little bit careful and, and everyone, I think everyone, I'm pointing out things that we see very often when we do these theory trainings. It's very easy to grab kind of, you know, important sounding sentences because a lot of quantitative details in there, but you want to think about how important is this particular assumption. It may be important for understanding whether their, their claim is, is true or not, um, but also making sure that the big items are in there. Like they use, this was based on modeling, not observations, but they also brought in observations as part of the evidence to compare their models to. Genevieve, do you have any other, because we're definitely, you know, this is part of the learning. This is really trying to identify what is evidence, what is reasoning, what is implication? So these are really good questions. Yeah, these are really good questions. And, you know, someone earlier mentioned, you know, a feeling of not having enough time. And I just want to reflect that. And, and especially when this is new, there's always that sense, I think, of not having enough time to really um, go deeply into something, especially because now we're bringing in a level of nuance, right? It's not just about the numbers, but are these numbers models or observations, right? It's beginning to sort of break down these bigger categories of information into now more subtle pieces. And that, um, that does get easier with practice. It does. It, in, especially as you start to learn the field jargon a little bit more, that is also helpful. And it just, over time, it takes less time. So there's this kind of learning curve that we're in right now. Um, I noticed that almost everybody in every room got at least something for every section. And I just need to say like top level, uh, very nice work. Like that's, that's excellent. This is not an easy paper. And uh, the fact that every group got at least one thing um, for every main category, I think is, is actually good work, you guys. Um, and this, this discussion about evidence and reasoning, I think, again, I always come back to, um, does this piece of information reference something external to the study, right? Does it reference a prior publication? Sometimes there'll be a citation to a prior publication, a prior data set. If it does, is there a really good chance that it's reasoning? Um, so that's sort of how I kind of just, you know, a rough gauge it. I think Carlos, I think this may be answered to Carlos's question. He asked whether 
if those quantitative details that Adriana mentioned about the models are referenced to any other papers, could that count as reasoning? Um, and that's that's a that's a good question. And I would actually, on this point, say it's evidence because it's describing the assumptions for the model. But at this point, you haven't gone to making a logical connection to the outcome, right? This is just the ingredients that go into it. Mm -hmm. And you know, and sometimes you know. I'm going to use, uh, let's say, Jiffy Spread peanut butter, right? So I'm referencing Jiffy Spread. I, I, it's just Jiffy, I guess. I'm using Jiffy peanut butter. Um, and just because I referenced Jiffy doesn't make it a reason. It's just kind of being specific about what are the ingredients that go in. Yeah. All, my, all my analogies are food for some reason. Um, <laughs> it's close to dinner time. That's why. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's jump to um, reasoning as we're there. Uh, and let me ask if someone from room uh, three could present what reasoning elements that they found in their group for this paper. Yeah, I guess I can go. Um, we uh, looked at like the claim and how, or well, the abstract and the claim, and it said how, um, what do you call it? The luminosity function associated with mixing of helium during merger envelope and core convection zone that occurs for a narrow range of masses and therefore our like first point uh kind of uh looks at that and uh links it to i guess our claim of uh or rather our evidence of uh the models of masses between so and so uh, with 0 0.3 and 0 0.38 uh, solar masses and uh the reasoning was that the transition between these behaviors for main sequence stars occurs over narrow mass range of 0 0.315 to 345 solar masses. And uh, so I guess one of the points that we made. Okay, so uh, so I see two elements in your, your text, which I think are, are, and thank you for those of you who are putting your quotes around copy text, excellent job. Um, so you've got the these two pieces of transition, between behaviors occurs over this narrow mass range. That definitely makes a nice reasoning connection to the fact that the observations show a narrow gap. And that the you have this other one that luminosity increases at least steadily and smoothly because 3HE is producing outer parts to the nuclear energy generation region. In Beckley makes the center. That's a lot of physics jargon, by the way. I'm not quite sure how that connects to reasoning. So one thing to be very careful about is, is you're copying text. If it is a lot of jargon, uh, you should, as a practice, try to break that down into your own words. So sometimes the paper just has the perfect line and you can just put it in there. But if it's a line that's densely worded in jargon, and I would say this is one of them, you should, in addition to putting that text in there, try to explain what that, that line means. So Sohan, can you explain what that line means? Uh, the put second you on the one? Spot. Yeah, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, okay, let me just reread it and get back to you real quick. Uh, um, I guess um, the I feel like I'm just gonna say it word for word, but um, the luminosity increases when uh, the helium is uh, the helium produced in the outer. I guess I'm reading it. You're just reading it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you get to a sentence where you can't explain it without just using the same words, you want to take a step back and say, "Do I really understand, you know, what this is saying?" And you know, sometimes it is written in the best way, so maybe that is the best words. But it, you know, to me, it's actually hard to read that. And I, you know, I'm I'm a long-term astronomer. I have a hard time parsing that sentence and seeing the connection between evidence and reason. So be careful, again, about just the copy and paste and you're done. Yeah. If you I, need, if yeah, I may, I want to actually want to add to that as a non-astronomer. I find these passages infuriating. I have no idea what it means, right? And um, I've been a science writer for a decade, and I, I just don't know what it means. So that's the kind of situation where I would flag it. I'd probably put it in like a green highlight. And that's that's a that's a passage I need to talk to somebody about, right? I need to talk to somebody who might understand it. And, you know, it's a great thing to bring to like a journal club or a research group and just raise it. You know, I read this passage. I want to read it to you. Can someone help me make sense of it? And I think these these become really important points for our own learning. Um, and it's really important to, 
I think it's really important to not assume that uh, you're the only one who doesn't understand it. In other words, if you don't understand it, there's a really good chance that at least two or three other people in your group don't understand it either. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so Sahan, thanks for bringing up a great teaching moment about, you know, there is being able to identify the elements of reasoning and understanding what those reasoning elements mean. And often that's where a lot of the jargon and concepts that you may not have seen before, words that even I can't parse together, because it may also be bad writing, that's a possibility. So I absolutely definitely encourage you when you get to those parts of phrases, and it seems like this is important, but I don't quite know what it means, bring those questions to our, our meetings or to the, the office hours that Dino and Roman have. Um, okay, so so thank you for introducing your uh, elements reasoning. Do any of the other groups want to share other reasoning uh, elements that they found in their uh, reading of the paper? Everyone's afraid because I uh, I put Sohan on the spot. Um, let me ask a different question. Are, and you can all see uh, room three's uh, reasoning there. Um, is that enough to connect the evidence to the claim? Are those two lines enough to connect the evidence to the claim? Can you say again that please? Sure. Are the two lines, so if you look at room three, and this is why we did this on the collaborative doc, so you can all see what each other's are writing as well. And room three reasoning, is that those two sentences that uh, the, the group pulled out, is that enough to connect the evidence to the claim? Well, to me, not because also we are, one of the teams that I feel that I need more time, but <laughs> but uh, it needs more um, needs conclusions. I mean, um, the claim is that uh, we are going to well, the, the the authors is going to give an explanation for the calf in the aha Gaia. That that's I think I understood. Yeah, and just to be clear, remember a claim is a declarative statement. So I would say the claim is stellar models, you know, normal stellar models can explain this gap. That's the claim. Okay. Yeah. But so, uh, yeah. So Adrian, you want to go on? Yeah, but the implications here is like a it's kind of trouble for me also. <laughs> Well, let's, so we're not at implications yet. So one part of this is to separate out these pieces so we can focus on specific concepts. So we just focus on reasoning. Um, and just because we're a little bit running on time, I, I will just say that uh, those are two important pieces of the reasoning, but it's not quite enough to connect the evidence to the claim that the models can explain the gap. Um, because there's a few more details that are in there. For example, you know, how, how does helium, uh, produce this gap, right? Helium is very clearly important because it's mentioned many times in the paper, but what is it about helium that is specific to making that gap? And what is it about convection? Because the second sentence also talks about convection being an important point. What is it about convection that produces that gap? Now, I will say that there's a, a, a very important figure in the paper and one of the things you can do in your description of the Siri review is say, in figure X, there's a clear explanation of why helium and convection explains the gap. And these kind of things where you're kind of providing yourself another uh, point to you know, uh, refer back to, okay, I remember there's something about helium and convection here. Do they explain this through figures? And figures are really powerful ways of explaining scientific ideas. So you can even bring into the figure and say, in figure X, uh, you know, they show the different models and they show how the luminosity forms a gap because of the different behaviors of helium mixing and convection. And even if you don't know fully what helium mixing and convection are and what they relate to each other, by pointing to the figure, that's another way to kind of remind yourself to go back and say, okay, 
I should really make sure I focus on this figure because that seems to be what is the key reasoning for, for how we go from the claim, uh, from the evidence to the claim. Yeah, and Genevieve just pointed out, this is a tough paper because this is a theory paper, right? Um, and so this is where you really need to sort of like look for those logical reasonings and logical points that connect one thing to the next to the next to get you to your claim. So I, I, I raised that because I saw uh, several other reasoning steps that other groups had, and I think stitching those together actually gets you to the right right chain. Uh, Javon, you had a question? Yeah, I, I might I could be completely wrong. I'm just looking, as you were mentioning the graphs, I was looking at it again and kind of connected to what we are talking about in the breakout rooms earlier. And it seems like, so the bottom, well, there's like um, the bottom part of figure three, it's about, it's on like the, I think, on the center value of the, or the OHG free function fraction. Yeah, let me bring up the actual uh, paper and we can look at that together. So this figure right here, right? Yeah. And so tritium is from uh, HE2 with a proton. And it seems like the it happens around the time when the luminosity for the stars also dipped. So um, is it like, so is it that last kind of like bit of reason that we have to, that we need as well to connect, you know, uh, HE3 with the uh, convective uh, mixing from partial to completely convective and the dip of the luminosity for these very uh, narrow range, but narrow mass range of stars. So a little bit. So um, so so one thing I wanted to point out, the reason I, I thought it's important to look at the figures for these, because it mentions a transition, but what transition? What transition are we talking about? And this mm -hmm. graph does show a change in behavior. For some of these models, you see that it kind of goes into a flat line and then it yeah. follows a curve upwards. For other models, it just goes up and then it comes back down. So there's mm -hmm. two different behaviors that change with mass. And that's the behaviors when they talk about the, the, the luminosity gap forms because you have essentially some models that go up and some models go down and in between up and down is a gap, right? So here we see and again, it's hard because this is a different quantity, right? We want to see an absolute magnitude, but instead we get this right. helium three fraction, which seems like <laughs> that matter. Um, but it's showing that when you go through this mass range, and these are all masses and solar masses, you get a transition from one behavior to another behavior. And that transition happens right at the mass that the Jow paper said, we see this weird gap. So it's part of the reasoning chain. It's not the full reasoning chain, right? Right. This right, you still have to yeah. connect what helium three, how that maps on to absolute magnitude. But we see the connection between mass and some things that's different in this helium three abundance. I see. So oh, because of that. So how the trends crossed between the uh, between two to ten, well between two to six, year. Section? Yeah, and even you know, don't necessarily worry about the age, but just yeah. just the pattern that there's two different kind of families of lines here, mm -hmm. and so that suggests there's a change in behavior that happens right around the middle of the range here, and right. and that's again part of the piece of the puzzle. I see. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, since we're at six o'clock, let's do a real quick uh, room four. Want to give us something about implications? Yes, so ours was a copy and paste, but what we used was, thus, if a large enough fraction of fully convective and dwarfs are rapid rotators, this could also give or enhance a dip in the luminosity function. So basically, it's kind of like the answer to the question or the, the main thing. So it's because, um, because of rapid rotation in M dwarfs, that's why we have this gap. That's like a suggestion. Okay, so so at some level, this is pointing to a future study because they don't bring they don't have any rotation measurements in this sample, right? That's not part of their evidence. Yeah, so no, no, they don't. Yeah, so they're telling us, hey, you observers, <laughs> go out and observe rotations because rotation might be a big part of this, and that you know that's something that we need to do in the future to make that measurement. 
or to, to, to study that part of it. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, any other groups have other implications that they put in? Uh, yeah, um, they also suggest, uh, they also say that um, their calculations are only for solar composition models. So this suggests that um, um, if you use other models that are not um, solar composition models, uh, it could potentially change the luminosity function deep. Um, yeah, and also um, they did not consider the effects of magnetic fields, uh, fields. So, um, and they also suggest that um, changing, uh, uh, yeah, um, if a large enough fraction of fully convective envelopes, so that's the part of um, magnetic fields. Um, yeah, I think that's the two main implications. Yeah, so, you know, one form that an implication can take, so thank you for bringing that up, Sky. One form that an implication can take is to recognize the limitations of one study and to suggest a path forward to making the analysis more sophisticated. Um, and you know, this is a very normal process for, for science. You start with the simplest model you can make to reproduce your data. And you know, that's gonna be probably incomplete, miss out some important things like metallicity, abundance of heavy elements, or magnetic fields. And you know, by reflecting and saying, we didn't include these things, but they might be important, that points the way to future research. So absolutely, this is a, this is a good example of implications. And by the way, a good example of a well-written paper is to recognize the limitations of one's own work and to propose ways to improve upon it. So I would say this is also a sign that this is a good paper, that they, they know where their limitations are and they, they've pointed them out. Okay, well, I wanna be mindful of our time because we're past six o'clock. Um, we won't have time to get to the second part of this, which is the um, looking at how we analyze and identify the kind of the quality of the paper. Although we've actually talked about some elements of this. You know, right now we just talked about, do the papers, you know, indicate the limitations of their study? Do they, you know, make appropriate assumptions? These are examples of, of the, the qualities. Let me actually bring up my slides again real quick to wrap up here. Um, there we go. All right, so we did our practice. So um, again, we won't have time to go in this detail, but we'll just leave this up here that, you know, one of the aspects of sort of analyzing these papers, once you've started to get an idea of what the paper's about. So the theory part, claim, evidence, reasoning, implications, is I would say the most important part of this process. If you can summarize the paper on these four axes, you've really got a good picture of what the, the study is. And again, it takes practice to identify these elements, to do it in an efficient and effective manner. And your guys are gonna get practice on this this summer because we're gonna have a few papers that we're gonna read. Uh, but when you go past that, it's to think about, is this paper a good paper? And you might think, well, of course it's a good paper, it's published, but not all papers are alike. And some papers are better than others. Some papers uh, make claims that may not be supported by the evidence. Some papers may make assumptions that are unrealistic. Um, and so part of the deeper dive of analyzing these papers is to look at your claim evidence reasoning and really, and, and implications and really think, is this a complete paper, right? Is their reasoning logic robust? Are their assumptions clear? And then is this an important paper, right? Is this a paper that you know, is addressing an important problem that has lots of implications? There's the implications part. Um, you know, does this affect other, other fields of study? And is this a well-cited paper? And we pointed to this NASA ADS site. And one of the things that you often see, if you, if you go to that NASA ADS page on the side, they have a link to some of the information about it. And one of those links is the citations. How many papers cite this paper? This is a, how I should say, not perfect measure of the importance of a paper. Um, some papers get cited just because it's a very active field. Uh, some really important papers don't get cited very much at all until it becomes, you know, people realize that this is an important paper. Um, so this is in perfect measure, but that's one way to understand whether this is a paper that has a big impact and it's addressing an important problem. And of course, if it's a new paper, no one cited it yet. So that's hard to measure whether it's an important paper or not. 
Um, and then the other thing that we won't have time today is, you know, a good practice is starting to compare papers together. And in fact, these two papers are a good match because one explains, you know, points out an interesting feature, this gap in the color magnitude diagram. And the second paper ex tries to explain it. And, you know, part of as you start to develop your, your scientific literacy, as you start to, you know, be able to draw on multiple references is to understand how these references are connected to each other. So unfortunately, we don't have time to go as an example of this, but uh, you'll see an example that's in the slides. And I would definitely welcome you to kind of practice this. It's really kind of identifying what's unique to each paper and what's in common. And that's kind of the first step to identifying uh, how these papers are interrelated with each other. And then the last thing I'll lay with is, um, you know, we did a particular template for this for our exercise, but we've also created a few other templates that you can use uh, to fill in uh, these Siri templates. And I'm gonna post all of these up on our course website or our, our summer research website. Um, and you are free to use them or just to create your own set of notes. But I would encourage you to come up with some kind of digital way of storing your research because you know, as you go through and read about some of these papers and get those pieces of claim evidence reasoning implication, you'll wanna go back and draw on the information for your presentation at the end of the summer and also for the publication at the end of the summer. So if you can get into a habit and a practice of keeping your digital notes in a structured way, in an organized way, it's gonna be much easier to then do that final project. And of course, not just for the summer, but also for your regular studies as well. So I will have those links up on the, um, the summer webpage uh, later today. Um, but Let's end with any questions that folks still have. And again, I know this is brand new. You guys are getting brand new things almost every day. So it's probably a little tiring, but you will have an opportunity to practice these things as you go through your reading assignments uh, because the main reading assignments we're gonna be giving are scientific uh, articles. So any other questions we can answer, Genevieve and I can answer right now. Well, um, I'll just chime in here in closing while questions might percolate up. I just wanna offer an individual experience myself where I use a Google Forms template to input my Siri notes. And then I send that to a spreadsheet. It's a Google spreadsheet. It's a really clunky interface. It's not great, but it creates this amazing archive of my own thinking about the papers that I read. Yeah. and. I can access it on my phone or on my laptop or whatever I happen to have with me at the moment. And I'm just getting ready in my doctoral program to go th through my comprehensive exams. Um, that's coming up in about a month for me. And that involves approximately 500 primary research articles that I need to read and understand over the course of the first three years of my doctoral program. And so, um, it took me a while to develop a regular practice of this because there is a learning curve as you're finding out, right? And not everything is super clear yet, but maybe you can get the gist of it um, to be able to consistently enter that, at least the basic Siri information into each uh, digital format, whatever that is. Um, as I'm studying now for my comprehensive exams, I have this amazing database of my past work to serve as my tutor. So I. I feel so much calmer about my exam compared to my classmates who are freaking out, right? Because 500 pieces of work is a lot to have to try to cram in a month. You can't do it. So, you know, this is also something, you know, your, your summer research now, your presentation at the end of the summer, and then, you know, whatever academic career you have going forward, hopefully this is a tool that you can carry with you. And it's like your past self, your past self helps your future self, right? keep track of the thinking. Yeah, so do we have, ah, do you, and here's a question from Delilah. Do you, would you suggest going back through the previously assigned readings and using Siri message with them? Yes, I do that. Um, I did that with some of the papers that I knew were very important in my early reading that I hadn't done any Siri with, or, you know, I don't know, I had some notes, but they were like highlights or something. So, 
I would definitely identify some of those, those key papers and I think it's worth going back. Um, and it's also interesting because you might learn things about those papers by using this method that you didn't get the first time. That's my experience that happens to me often. Um, and, and then, you know, you might also ask your research advisor in the summer if there are any particular papers that you might do this with, right? Just for kind of background knowledge coming into your, your summer work. You'll get them. Don't worry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you got them already. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, well, uh, um, if there's no other questions, um, we'll have the uh, recording for this posted up on the website a little bit later on. Um, I'll also post up the slides, including uh, some of Genevieve's slides as well. Um, and then the, the templates for the reading. And indeed, uh, you know, Delisle both moving forward and backwards if you wanna go back to your old readings, but particularly as we move forward, I would strongly encourage you to, you know, try out these templates or make something of your own so you can organize these Siri elements. And I will say that either, part of either our Monday or our Friday meetings will also include a Siri every week. So you're, you're gonna get practice with this as a group as well. All right. Uh, great. Uh, so everyone have a great rest of your Tuesday. Uh, Dino, uh, who uh, is still with us, but will be having office hours uh, now, uh, will be available for office hours. And um, otherwise, if you have any other questions, uh, don't forget to uh, either ask Dino or Roman or ask the Slack channel. We'll be, where, we'll be there to help. Uh, and our next uh, meetup will, I think, be on Friday for our Friday meeting. All right. Have a great day, everyone, uh, and see you soon. Oh, don't forget, we have observing tonight if you want to join that as well. So that, that link is in the email.